Hi, I'm Nathan L. Weller. I'm a professional actor. Um, I've been doing this since about 2017. First of all, I started off in amateur dramatics and then I was picked up after being spotted in an Amdram play and taken on by an agent in London. Since when I've been in a number of TV pilots, feature films, short films and even a BBC Radio 2 te television commercial. At what age did acting first start becoming an interest to you? I was always interested at school in being kind of like the class clown, I suppose, uh, an entertainer very much, looking for approval from peers most of my life. And so drama was an easy way of getting into that sort of thing. But I never really took it anywhere. I mean, I got involved with what there was at school, but there wasn't much in the sort of school I went to. At university, I did little bits here and there, sketches, short bits of drama, but nothing major once again. There was a lot of competition for the major roles and it all seemed like rather too much effort. But as I got older, got into my late 30s and I didn't really have any hobbies uh, beyond going to work in an office job, which was pretty much the same day in, day out. And there was nothing exercising my creative side. So that's when I took act, gave an acting another look. Uh, and decided that maybe that there was something there for me after all. And so after sort of a 25 year hiatus maybe, finally got back into the craft. And did you have any icons or inspirations growing up? I was always into um, sitcoms, comedy, those sort of things, because that's generally what my family watched at home. Of course I'm growing up in the 80s, the 90s at home, and so there wasn't like now where you all have screens in every single room. I didn't have my own personal choice of what to watch. So what the family wanted to watch was what we all watched. And that involved quite a few American and British sitcoms. There'd be some drama stuff as well, but we might be able to excuse ourselves and go to our rooms and play with toys or something rather than watch the boring adult drama at that time. So it was generally the comedy icons um, of that era were the ones that I grew up watching. Uh, so you're looking at sort of Monty Python, uh, 40 Towers, uh, A Lower Low, all of these kind of 1980s sitcoms, some of which are probably less politically correct these days, but um, certainly that's what, I, what was my bread and butter growing up. And outside of acting, has there been any other jobs that you've done? Uh, well, as I say uh, earlier, I've been kind of doing office work, IT-based office work for... Uh, ooh, 25 years now since university, uh, which is it's fine because it pays the bills. Um, I know plenty of professional actors in the industry who still live with their parents or who generally can't afford uh, their, their own mortgage, so uh, live, live in shared houses and things even well into their 40s and 50s. And uh, obviously uh, I've been able to have uh, actually uh, my own... <laughs> My, a wife, a family, a, a large house and things I wouldn't have been able to afford on an actor's salary or income because a lot of people don't understand with acting. A lot of teenagers getting into acting think that they're all earning enormous amounts of money and just absolutely rolling in it. But um, it's a really limited percentage of actors, that very top 0.01% who will be the superstars. There are something like 10 million people listed on IMDb and that's an awful lot of people um, going for not that many jobs, actually. Um, there's always more actors than there are jobs available. And so you have to be, you have to find your niche. You have to be offering something different, something special, um, or just be better at what you do than a lot of other people. And a, a lot of luck comes into, into it as well. It's hard work, luck. There, there is training. There is um, things you can do to help help yourself in the industry. But... I don't think a lot of people going into it, young people going into the industry, think about how much hard work they will actually be involved. And there's even like the soft skills side, like networking, and you've got to be able to maintain those relationships with casting directors, agents, um, other people you come across, other actors, because if you get known as being difficult to work with, then the work may well dry up. And what do you remember about your first professional audition? Oh, so... Not even sure what my what my first one would have ever been with my when I had my agent in July, twenty seventeen. I remember one early one, where I was going to BFI Southbank for an audition, and it was for 
I think it was only for a short film. It might have been a feature film, but I'm very uh, I'm unprepared, but not because I want to be unprepared. It was a very disorganized shoot. So the script didn't arrive until the day before or something. And then when I'm getting this, I'm looking at it and saying to my agent, they want me to play an elderly Indian shopkeeper. And <laughs> I said, I can do that, but it's going to be very racist. Uh, and she said, it's fine. They've said, you don't have to do that. Just do it however you like. Um, and so I got to the audition and I said, said to the guys that were, who were there, it was like my first sort of panel of death, your three or four people who were staring at you and, um, and said, well, I, obviously I'm not an elderly Indian. Um, how do you want me to play this? And they said, just do what you like. And that was not how I expected any audition to be run by anyone ever, because I thought to myself, well, I'm still new to this game of acting at this point, but even I've got several different ways I can play this. An experienced actor might have got tens or hundreds of different ways they can play this shopkeeper character. Um, you know, what part of the country are they from? What's their background? You know, how do they treat people? What's their personality? And the idea you had to pick just one of those options and present it to the director and hope it was the one that they would have liked, when actually there might have been a different one that you didn't choose that they might have liked, normally you would hope, with an in-person audition, you might have actually get a bit of that direction to tell you which way to go. I didn't have any of that direction. They were just, no, uh, that's, that's fine, just do it once and then go on, your, on with your way. And I never heard anything again about the job. And that was a quick lesson into acting, is that a lot of jobs and auditions you go for you never hear anything back. Um, but most in-person auditions have been a lot better than that because if you're not going to get any direction, you might as well do a self-tape and not travel into London. And what's been your most memorable role? I think um, Creek Encounters, which is a feature film. It's a sci-fi horror feature film coming out spring 2024. Uh, trailers are up on YouTube now. And I play a MI5 scientist in that whose job is to investigate alien incursions I'm not entirely sure MI5 have such a department or person, but uh, that's who I was. I got my own white lab coat and um, thrown through a table. So um, that, that's all all fun and good. Um, had to do my own stunts because it was an independent feature film and there was no budget for stunt people or anything. And they said, we'll throw you through this table now. And I, I said, well, if I land on that table, I, it's it doesn't look a very strong table. I'm, I'm not a big guy, but I'm not a small guy. I'm going to snap this table in half. And they said, it's fine. We're, in, we're going to one take this anyway because of some of the special effects they were using. They, they could only do once. And so lo and behold, they threw me onto the table. I snapped the table in half and they went cut and it was all good. So, but that's memorable, I suppose, because it's, was it my possibly the first, because I filmed my pieces for this middle of 2021. So it might have been the first time I was in a feature film with a decent amount of speaking lines. I've had smaller roles in other feature films where I've got the odd line here and there. Um, there's a few up on Amazon Prime, like Surveilled and Casting Kill. Um, Best Geezer is doing the festival circuit at the moment. But Creek Encounters, I've actually got a real role, a real new named character, and uh, I won't tell you what happens to him and beyond the throwing through a table. But um, yes, yeah, so that's good. Um, and that film looks like it's going to make some waves with distributors. And so we're hoping it's going to actually get into cinemas, which not a lot of independent feature films do, unless they have some major hook that p gets people interested, like the Winnie the Pooh horror films that came out recently, which were by all accounts, I've not seen them, um, but uh, by all accounts, not actually brilliantly made horror films, but because of the, I suppose, the freak value of seeing Disney properties um, in that sort of situation got them into the cinemas and got people to go and watch. But I think Creek is going to use a lot more, um, I don't want to blow around trumpet too much, but sort of high, higher quality filming techniques and scripting and pacing and effects and so on and so forth. Uh, so hopefully will be a better, better reviewed film than, than um, Blood and Honey turned out to be. Which I've not seen myself yet and I don't plan to. <laughs> I stick to the animations. <laughs> and has there been any role that you have played that you remember being quite difficult with working with that role? Um, I think there have been a few roles where when you get onto set, your role gets diminished from what was originally perhaps advertised to you. And so you kind of put yourself out to, to get involved in a particular production because you think it's going to be more than it actually is. And then your role, there's been a couple of things I've been in where I've been 
cut out completely or there's 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 a short film where you see my hand um but because they couldn't use the sound on the day that they filmed um i was a, i was a media interviewer i was interviewing outside of gloucester prison um, we were shooting the short film it's doubling for a prison in Ohio, uh, <laughs> but uh, with uh, all the American p police cars and other actors and things. And I had my American accent on, and I was a media interviewer interviewing Sophia Miles and Lindsay Duncan, as it happened, um, who were there, you know, in their character roles. And but they couldn't use the sound from that day, the outside sound for whatever reason, um, you know, external noise or, or whatever. And so in the final cut, they even dubbed over my line, which they could do easily enough because they'd cut my face out and just have my arm holding the microphone in their faces. Uh, and that was a, a big disappointment because that was my first time working with sort of m more major actors um, such as Lindsay and Sophia. Um, I'm still credited on, on IMDb for it, but it's... Um, yeah, that, that, that was a bit disappointing. And, and there's been a few others like that where it's like the number of lines you have gets gets cut down or you are promised greater involvement and then you, you don't end up with that. Um, there's been a couple of TV pilots I've done where you're waiting and waiting to see if any network will actually pick up the TV series and say, oh, that, that looks brilliant. We'll definitely make that. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, it, it doesn't happen. Um, we shot a very high quality uh, period TV pilot called The Night Riders in Cornwall back in May 2021. Uh, I think it was shot over most of 2021, but my part was particularly in May, which was sort of 1700s. Um, we shot it in the same harbour, Charleston Harbour, that they shot Poldark stuff in. And they, people, lo the locals watching us thought we were shooting more Poldark, in fact, so it was the same kind of era and costumes. And I was playing a merchant trying to defend his daughter from pirates and all this sort of thing. Um, and that was sort of very high production values. But um, then a trailer once again is up on YouTube if you search for the Knight Riders trailer. But no network as of yet appears to have picked it up. And, and that's a great shame, really, because it looked like it was it was one of those things that could have been like a 10 part miniseries or or turn into a sort of two, two and a half hour feature film, depending on which way the networks wanted to take it. And there was enough interesting characters in there. There was romance and action and all this sort of stuff. And uh, uh, obviously me with this ridiculous wig on playing this 1700s merchant. Um, I like doing those period pieces because I actually, before I got into acting, uh, my wife's a keen medieval reenactor and, and in fact other historical periods reenactor as well. So she got me into those kind of things and so I've done medieval and Victorian and Regency and all these kind of things. And so I, I do like that kind of historical perspective on stuff. I've done a lot of living history things so you get to interact with the public in your persona in those roles. and so even before I actually got back into acting in 2017, I was kind of doing reenacting, which is, I suppose, acting again. And has there been any artists that you enjoyed working with? Um, I mean, major artists um, I've had limited exposure to. I was in a film recently called Surprised by Oxford, which had Simon Callow um, and Mark Williams and Phyllis Logan and people in, uh, but I only really got any talking time with um, Phyllis Logan um, and I mean, she, everyone was lovely, but it was just that I had a very small kind of cameo role in that film because it was, you know, big names, big actors. Um, the love interest in that film, though, was a guy called Rory O'Connor, who played actually um, Henry in The Spanish Princess and has been in a few other things. And he was a, a really solid chap and I really enjoyed working with him. Very friendly, very personable. Uh, we actually carried on communicating for a while um, after the shoot had finished um, to keep up with each other. So I mean, that was nice, and it was just to show, go to show that, I mean, some of the big actors you work with, they may have got a very high opinion of themselves, but a lot of them are just down to earth, and they're just there to, you know, be friendly, do a job, and, and get on with it. And is there anyone that you would like to work with in the future? Um, I think probably something like David Tennant, um, or um, my, my oldest daughter's got a bit of a thing for David Tennant. Uh, that's not just the only reason, no. I mean, obviously I love him in Doctor Who, but also Good Omens and a bunch of other things he's done. Um, we've got his copy of Hamlet on the shelf behind you. Um, and so I think he's a very versatile actor, and, and that's, I think that, that would be a, um, a very good experience to work with him. Um, people like Martin Freeman, um, Benedict Cumberbatch, I kind of, Last sort of 20 years, I've obviously watched a lot of their stuff um, and various things have appeared in. Um, yeah, I think it's th those sort of kind of high level British actors. I don't think there's really sort of any American actors um, that I've got a particular, um, 
immense desire to work with them. I mean, of course, it'd be great to work with any of um, any big names, really. But um, yeah, I think David Tennant would probably be the number one. Mm. And is there any other career you would like to pursue? So maybe writing or directing? Well, because my uh, family also do some acting, my children are all child actors. There's actually a couple of them away um, in Europe at the moment filming a commercial. And so I actually get to do a bit of directing when we're doing their self-tapes here in this room. Uh, and I can see where the appeal might come to that uh, from that to me down the line. I do do a bit of writing. Um, once again, back to my roots, doing more sitcom writing and things that I think I would like to, to appear in. Um, you know, sometimes with other people, co-writers, but also with myself, trying to find those little niche ideas um, that might fit in to a whole... Because a lot of sitcoms, you can't do the same thing again. It's like... If I was going to write about life in an office, well, you've got The Office has done that already. I know it's a mockumentary more than a sitcom. You've got the IT crowd has done all that kind of, you know, that sort of things. And so you think, well, what would be the new angle if I was going to set it in an office place? Um, and you have, so you have to try and find some new setting or new angle. This sitcom pilot I shot uh, last year is called Work in Progress. And um, we saw the premiere of that uh, a couple of months ago. That's gone out to TV networks to see if they want it at the moment. Um, major character in that and that the angle there is that two childhood friends make a deal whilst they're at primary school about 10 years old that if either of their lives ever falls apart they can just throw themselves on the other one's mercy but now 25 years have passed and uh, I suddenly turn up on my school friend's front doorstep I haven't seen him for years he's now got twin teenage boys he's a single father and he's a drag artist um, and we've actually got a, tr um, a trans actor um, playing as the opposite, my opposite number there, and a couple of really great teenage um, boy actors there, um, and so that was sort of a, I think, a new, a new kind of odd couple kind of setup because I ended up, up, you know, sleeping on the sofa and annoying the children and having a succession of terrible jobs and terrible girlfriends, which is why I've crashed with him in the first place. It's because I've lost my job and my girlfriend. But as the series goes on, I just make all the wrong life decisions uh, whilst. He's um, the sensible one, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, we. As I say, we hope that networks will see something in that and refilm. Uh, obviously, the pilot was shot on a limited budget, so they'd have to refilm the pilot sort of thing that would end up as a DVD extra doing the original pilot, I guess. But uh, um, I mean, it may it may need a bit of a, a bit of a rewrite or some changes. But you hope that those concepts are the things you find. You find some new concept or angle that gets people's interest and then you know it's it's a new setting where you can exploit for humor, humorous purposes and what would you say are the advantages and disadvantages of working in this industry i mean the disadvantages are the same as i'd say any gig economy job really uh, i mean it's almost the ultimate zero hours contract you might get uh, be acting all of this week and earn hundreds or even thousands of pounds then um, you may not get anything ever again. <laughs> I mean, it's literally like that. I've, I've, I know professional actors who haven't had a professional acting job in two years. So you have to be able to support yourself outside of that. Anyone who's coming through drama school and thinking, I'll be a full-time actor and not need to do any other jobs. That's lovely if you've got the financial backing to support yourself because then you've got all the time in the world to do training and auditions and self-tapes and networking and so on and so forth. A lot of people don't have that financial backing, of course, and that's why there is this skewed industry where generally people from richer families have got the ability to actually have their children go into the industry in that, that sort of way and have more chances because if they can go to more auditions without having to get time off work, if they can do more training, if they can do more networking, they're more likely to get ahead. And yet the working class actors who are stuck having to work you know, two, three jobs to make ends meet and then trying to get time off from those to actually go to auditions, it's very hard for. And I don't know what the answer is, but it's that is a real problem in the industry. I mean, the advantage is you, you have experiences that you wouldn't have anywhere else. I mean, you know, I've been in a BBC studio in West London um, shooting a Radio 2 television commercial with Zoe Ball. Um, I've turned on the Christmas lights in my hometown of Cheltenham whilst acting as Scrooge in the performance of Christmas Carol in front of 12,000 people in the crowd, apparently. Um, so that's not things I would have thought of when I ever got into professional acting in the first place in 2017, that within five, six years, 
all of these things, experiences would have happened, the people I've met, the places I've been, um, from running around a disused leisure centre in South East London, which was a, for a sort of Die Hard-esque short film. Um, yeah, it, it, to some of the long drives I've had, filming in fields, filming, uh, filming locally for local museums. Um, filmed a commercial, a Christmas commercial once in August, you know, and having to wear all the thick jumpers and a snow, ma in a s snow machine outside the window. And th these things you, uh, are experiences that not many people are going to have. Um, but yes, you need to be able to afford the time to have them. Mm -hmm. And what advice would you have for anyone that wants to go into this industry? Um, as I say, network, network, network. The first few years of my professional acting career I spent so much time just trying to get involved with independent films, up and coming directors, a lot of people who were, you know, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, who were sort of the next generation coming through of directors, producers, casting directors, and just helping them out with the films they were currently making, the productions they were currently making in whatever way I could. And that's how you get known. That's how you get your name and face out there. And then people go, oh yeah, Nathan can do that. Um, I mean, it does mean that a lot of them put me into uh, dad roles now, and I get played play, play a lot of dad roles. Being a forty-five-year-old man, father of four daughters, um, at least I have the experience. So it's almost like method acting, I suppose. Okay, thank you very much for your time today, Nathan. Not a problem. Thank you.